that of the priesthood, that of the minister, and that of the pastor. I think we mentioned that before. Yes. And the other is possible to um, know what actually the functions are of these, these three aspects. First of all, the priest is he who is ordained or laying, uh, uh, laying on of hands coming from the bishop who was himself a successor of the apostles. And thus the priest receives the grace from the uh, apostles. We can directly trace the itself it is a um, transmittance of uh, speaking esoteric language, sort of transmittance of grace or energy or power, but it's nothing to do with uh, uh, automatic grace. It is a blessing given, apostolic blessing given to the priest in order to function as a priest, as a minister, as minister of grace, and as a public figure, or a person who instructs not only the individual as a pastor, as a priest, a profession, but the whole society. The function of a bishop, for example, who is archpriest, right? <coughs> priest is ar the, the bishop is arch, you know? Archbishop is the highest degree of priest. He is to teach the word of God. There is even a catch <coughs> when a bishop does not preach. Three Sundays in a row he is to be expelled. In other words, his whole meaning is transmitting the teaching of the gospel. That's why in his mantle, his mantle has got a purple, white and red stripes. They symbolize speaking or the wisdom of God coming out in waves. It's expected that he transmits both the teaching through his, through his life, of course, through his um, uh, words, and also that he bestows grace. He watches that the grace which he received and given to priests and so on is properly um, uh, used and channeled to people. He also is <coughs> responsible for a particular diocese, a particular region, wherein he is the master. It is an or not orthodox idea that you have archbishop who is over him. That's not an orthodox idea. You have bishop who is in charge of the whole thing and it's all state. Archbishop is merely a title of respect of an elderly man who is respected. Archbishop. Metropolitan is a bishop in charge of metropo metropolis or a particular metropolitan area. In other words, usually a city. A bishop who is sees in the city and sort of local. And Patriarch is a grandfather figure. Administratively, according to Orthodox teaching, he does almost nothing. He is just simply in charge of the whole sort of overseas. He is the grandfather figure. He blesses his fires and so on. He doesn't meddle in all these um, monetary things and so on. But the bishop does. <coughs> his job is to see that in his diocese there is order. People follow Christian principles. That he is ruling with love. That his law is love. That he is fair. And that he has a responsibility to the society. Therefore, as we have that, I have that example. If a criminal comes to a, an abbot, runs like Moses the Ethiopian, remember? He ran to the abbot. There is one simply in the, the, the outlaw. Russian church. <coughs> he ran to the um, uh, abbot, knocked at the gate, and says, I want to see the abbot. 
the gatekeeper says, what is it? I want to see the abbot. Do you hear that? I've got guns here. Do you hear that? I want to see the abbot right away. So the abbot comes in and says, what do you want, my son? I want you to touch me. Why do you want me? Because my heart moved, and I'm abandoning all my past, and I want to be a, uh, made monk right away. I want, I want to be monastic. Yes, I want to die to the world. Yeah, I'm through, through the, with the sinful world. Can you take me and make me a monk? Sure. Or he said, in one of them said, well, he said, in that case, I can kill you. I'm surround, I'm, your monastery is surrounded with my band, my crooks. We are going to kill you off. Right now, I'm in a good state. <laughs> <laughs> Grab it. I'm going to be a good monk. I'll do anything for you. Because God touched my heart, and I want to be here. I love you. I think you're great. I love you. The whole monastery. Make me all my monks around it. All my, my outlaws will be monks. <laughs> uh, and if you won't, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Don't you want me to repent? <laughs> and Abbot says, yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Come on, give me scissors. They, they took the scissors and made him a monk, and the rest of those, those outlaws are all monks. There's even an old famous Russian song. When they come to a, long, a monastery, and there comes out this man, talks a big story about that, and ends the last person, and he himself is telling the story. Now, but if a bishop were in charge, if a, some monastery's bishop is in charge of a monastery, he cannot do a thing like that. He, because he's bound up with the state, with the government. He's overseeing the spiritual society. He has to immediately turn him to police and prison. But abbot can't, because the abbot is bound up with what? Running away from the world. And thus that outlaw offers himself. He wants to change his life and be like a prisoner. He only wants to be prisoner in the monastery. And the abbot can do it. So, the, the bishop is in charge of his flock, sure, but at the same time of the whole city. He's, busy, let's say, in a city, some kind of a bad thing going on. Has nothing to do with his flock, nothing to do with his religion. He has to come up to the city, what is, uh, a town, the city hall, and he has to storm and <coughs> tell them that this is wrong and so on, so on, so on. He has to set the tone for society. And if he doesn't, and doesn't use the gospel, then he is to be expelled. Saint Isaac the Syrian, somebody likes to read this book, it's a dangerous, dangerous book. He was a bishop of town. And there were two very influential rich people. They were, in fight, they were fighting each other. And they came and both of them had wanted him as a bishop to settle the question. And he figured it out the situation and said, yes, well, the scripture says so and so. And therefore, the man said, leave your scripture alone. Then, Isaac the Syrian being a bishop, he said, okay, then I'm no judge of yours. Goodbye, you and the whole parish and the whole diocese. Get you lost. I'm going to go to the desert. Went to the desert and became the famous eyes of the Syria. In other words, the society has to accept the Christian principle. <coughs> and he felt that the society was not, didn't want it. So he's just quit the whole thing. Now, the, therefore, the priest <coughs> is <coughs> obedient tool in the hands of a bishop. A priest cannot celebrate the liturgy without the permit of a bishop. The permit of a bishop consists in antimincian. Antimincian is a cloth. Now it's a cloth. But originally it was nothing else but a coffin of a martyr. You cannot serve liturgy without a piece of a bone <coughs> of a martyr. No liturgy can be performed without that. So, eventually they did this. They have this cloth, and there's a picture of Jesus' um, shroud, you know, and in the back they're sewn <coughs> in a piece of a bone of a martyr, so that the liturgy is performed on the bones of a martyr, even though a tiny piece. Originally, they were in coffins. That's why the original, the shape 
of the altar table originally was a coffin. Later on they made it square now because so that sort of it's even to all four sides of the universe. You know, west and north is even. So that's the principle. But originally there was nothing but a coffin. And you still, up to today, you don't have a, a, an Antimensian, you cannot serve. And so the bishop gives this Antimensian to the priest uh, to serve. It's issued as a part of a priest. Usually it stays with, on the altar table of a particular parish. And uh, the, um, um, there are some, t some priests, they're called missionary priests. They have their own, issued by a bishop, you signed. And that Antimensian, he travels with it. Sometimes a bishop can give his own personal and so if, uh, bishops do the pansimitsi, they do the sanctify the sign and so on. <coughs> and he gives to a priest like Archbishop John gave to Bishop Nictari, and Bishop Nictari gave me. So it's his own private thing. But as a rule, as a part of um, uh, a church. I mean, yeah, or altar table. Now, the priest, yes? Is, is there such a thing as an antimensium without a relic in it? No, that doesn't exist. All right. Thank you. Or if there's somebody didn't put one in, that doesn't mean it's without a relic. But I mean, you cannot serve. serve liturgy on it. No, you can't. Even if it's been uh, blessed and. No. All right. Okay. No, it's supposed to. <coughs> now, now about the priest. The priest is. Um, appointed to head a parish. What is a parish? A parish is nothing else <coughs> but a distant relative to the catacomb community. The catacomb community with one purse, one, it's a commune, one soul. They live together, they uh, breathe together, they pray together, they work together, they're responsible to each other, and St. Paul says, carry each other's births, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is the um, is expressed in a community that is like Christ's community, the apostles. They had one common life, and then later on it included other people, 70 or more. It had women and women, the women who served, and so on. This community. So parish is a distant relative of the same thing. Therefore, parish has to resemble that type of community. It has to have one soul. It has to have a hall where they would <coughs> have dinners or agapis. It has to have a location for a school or something. It has to have an access. It has to be accessible to people, new people coming. Therefore, it has a narthex. Parish owns the building of a church and the land. <coughs> of course, there are various situations. The Roman Catholic Church is all actually proper to a Roman Pope. But, uh, and it cannot be of a bishop. You can be of diocese, head of a diocese, but cannot be bishop because bishop is a monk, and monk cannot have any private property. Therefore, <coughs> uh, it's been violation here and there when bishops do that, but that's non canonical. Uh, the parish has to have a com that is committee of rulers. They have to be chosen, just like apostles, chosen whenever, whatever period of time. And their job is to be able to maintain an atmosphere that is charged with Christian spirituality, which is accessible to, on a very primitive level, to people who come new, outsiders. It has to have an approach so that the new people would come and be you know, touched by what Christianity is all about. <coughs> Therefore, it is a teaching institution. It has, it celebrates liturgy, sacraments are performed there, but at the same time in a place where you're supposed to teach. That's why you have sermons. In old times, they had those pulpits. They had, they had elevation where a, a priest or teacher was taken up and speak so that uh, well, far away people could hear him, so the teaching would reach. The very process of liturgy or the liturgical uh, service, the service is to be conducted outside of the altar. 
If you notice, all services, except for the uh, exclamations and except for the sacrament of liturgy, all uh, is conducted outside of ikonostasis. The deacons have to come out and so on and so on. That is because it has to be accessible to people. But not all of it. There are secret prayers. Now it is modern, the modern people, the renovationists, they install this idea that all secret prayers have to be read aloud in order to jazz up so people can sort of feel where they are. Because, you know, to wake them up, because they usually sit in their pews, half asleep, and so it becomes a secret, the whole idea is something secret, so they pay attention to them, but they open the doors. This is all funny, because that part, what the priest conducts, is a relationship between him and God. He is performing the sacrament, not the people. The people are the recipients. So he has a definite, he's even his back towards everybody. He is doing his business with God. He has a job to do. Therefore, these prayers, and even the holy doors are closed up and so on, all kinds of things, are the, is the territory where the priest is performing a service wherein he obtains the grace from God, from above. <coughs> Having obtained, he has to distribute. The distributing of grace is already next stage, which is called the administering. The administering. <coughs> and he has to administer in such a way that this very grace will not choke people. It will not be unto damnation. Because Holy Communion is fire. And when you misuse the fire, you scorch or burn. And a priest has to understand that. And it has been time and again, it has been seen the Orthodox priests and holy people who serve liturgy and they see literally fire coming down into the chalice. St. Sergius was seen to be, uh, have that. And even as, as far as not far from uh, us, Archbishop John was seen. In fact, I saw a person who saw that, talked to a person who saw it, that very, that in the form of a tulip, fire came out of and entered the chalice. So when a priest comes around, turns around, and gives Holy Communion, he has to know <coughs> what he's doing. So he will not <coughs> give fire, and that will scorch the soul, and the soul is not prepared. Therefore, the minister has to be a confessor. He has to, as the Russian term is, serce vedets. Dushepa pichitsi, it is serce vedets, which means knower of hearts. Sets of his heart, heart knower. The priest has to have contact with a person whom he gives Holy Communion. He has to know what ticks the man, what makes the man behave the way he behaves, why he performs certain sins, and how to uh, help him to get rid of that, and how to uh, inspire him more. He has to be the confessor. So the second part is, the priest has to know how to present, or how to prepare the soul, or rather the earth of the soul of the man, to such an extent that the holiness of communion sacrament will descend properly and bring forth fruit. Because it's the fruit upon the fruit that will be given what? Salvation. Not the very action, but the result of our action. Therefore, an, a priest is not to, a, pa, a parish priest is not to mimic an elder. Why? The following reason. A monastic elder. In other words, we talked before about the black clergy and the white clergy. The black clergy is that which cut itself away from the world, right? Monastic. They are not even supposed to be clergy. Do you understand? It's a mistake. Athanasius the Great made. Where is Athanasius here? Oh, there he is. Your patron made a mistake. Monastics are supposed to be simply <coughs> monks, repentance, living in the woods, and just concentrating on their souls. <laughs> dead to the world. But a pastor is a parish pastor. 
He is to know the world. That's why he has to be married, he has to be children. In fact, he can't be not, cannot even be ordained um, uh, subdeacon if he is not married canonically. He has to be, and he cannot be made a deacon until he has children. Because deacon's wife is the teacher, and deacon is the teacher of children. So he has to have children. So the parish priest is to know the society. He has to know the people, how they work, what they do, how what difficulties they go through. He has to visit their homes, he has to bless their homes with holy water. He has to be aware the problems that they face. For example, according to the law in Russia, and Russia was, you know, uh, was an Orthodox Empire. It had, uh, it, the Orthodox was a state religion. And it was considered, it was given as a job to priests and parish people to see to it that their parishioners receive Holy Communion and Confession at least four times a year because there are four fasts. <coughs> it is a, at least an absolute minimum. And that means that when a person is baptized or raised, and as you know, a child is baptized, and when a baptism occurs, the parents are not to be present. And everybody violates this. When a child is baptized, the parents are not to be present. Why? Only the godparents. Because that's flesh. And God, godparents are chosen by the parents to take care of the soul until the child grows up to seven years old, and then he has to be responsible for himself. That means the parents are viewing the child as their own flesh, therefore impartial. They cannot oh, spiritually um, view it. Therefore, when he's, the child is baptized properly, then he is conducted by God, parent, God, father, to church, and he gets the first confession when he's seven years old, and then he's on his own, and he gets the education of the church, not from his parents, but from the deacon. In other words, a person who is appointed by the priest. And the priest in church is called what? A doctor? A philosopher? An instructor? No, but what? Father. Father. But the child gets a father in the priest and a godfather in a person who leads him to church and gives, uh, opens up his eyes and a godmother to the girl. Then when the child is exposed to the confession, then the priest watches that this child goes to, the, the godparents who uh, watches, but when he's grown up, the priest has to see to it that he goes to confession. He goes, the confession, as we discussed before, and we will continue again later on, is not an interrogation. Confession is not the time for sermonettes. The confession is not a time to chat a little or counsel. None of them. Confession is repentant admittance of one's shortcomings before the law of God. Therefore, the law of God is to be taught by the priest. Well, coming ahead, I'll just say that when a person comes to um, the church to um, the parish, he has, is entering this Christian apostolic community in which <coughs> he is to feel, to receive all the spiritual, whether it's juices, whatever is necessary. He grows. He has to be not manipulated. Please cannot manipulate. He cannot play elder. In a minute, I'll talk about that. He cannot, priest is not to do anything with the soul. The term let, let's, let us work, work with you. It's also not very orthodox. A person has to do the work himself. It's almost like a robot, you know. You cannot do it for him. He has to do it himself. When a child uh, realizes that he, as a state requirement, is to give confession, and receive divinity, Holy Communion, in his soul, which is supposed to help him to transfigure, to transcend, to make him feel 
and <coughs> make him be a member of kingdom of God, he is when he that when, it's, when that occurs, then the so-called we call, the Catholics call it obligation, but Orthodox call it the sort of strength to receive strength. When you're strength, when you receive that strength, you have strength to combat evil or various temptations. Therefore, four times a year, it was required that minimum that a person comes for confession and that his confession and his communion is recorded in the book, in the book's annals of the church. On such and such a day, such and such people receive communion. Why? A good example is this. I like to use them, you probably heard it. A boy goes to Safeway and steals a Hershey bar. And he's caught. <coughs> he's brought to police. And the police says, what is this? He says, what's that's a wrapper? Well, you devoured it. Yes, I devoured it. Did you pay for it? No, I didn't. Why did you devour it when you did not pay? Somebody else paid it? No. Did you take it on credit? No. Well, in that case, in plain British, would be you stole it. I, I don't have I don't have a quarter or well, fifty cents, fifty seven cents nowadays. I don't have that money, but mommy will pay. No, mommy didn't steal it. Why should you pay? She didn't devour it. You devoured her she didn't you? Therefore you come to police and there's we're gonna take your name down. And nowadays we do this, the police says your name and the whole thing, and it goes on the computer. The boy becomes a criminal. He's got a criminal record. But in Russia, it was like that. The policeman says, Aha, you stole this thing. Mm -hmm. Which parish do you belong to? Say, well, I belong to St. Joseph Arimathea's parish. Oh, I see. Okay. Is that Joseph Arimathea's parish? Yes. Would you be kind enough to look at the records of this kiddo? George Jeffries, did he receive Holy Communion last year? Why, well, sure, seven times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, my dear, go ahead. Here's 25 cents. Get another Hershey bar. In other words, he just slipped. There's no reason for him to become a, a criminal. He doesn't mean to just slip. Because the boy knows what's right and what's wrong, and he just slipped, and he feels sorry for him, and so on. He changed, he will change. Because he knows better. There's a record. He knows better. He received from the community confession. Thus, the society was encouraging good behavior. And then, this, therefore, checking, check and balance. In other words, he had to go and uh, there was a record of his standing in the church. The priests, therefore, the job is to inspire the parishioners. <coughs> through teaching and so on. I'll give an example of um, <coughs> Priest the Father, a knower of soul, and um, spiritual father, instructor, professor, confidant, and guide, and so on. There was a case. His name is Father Peter of Ugrich. He was a priest, nice priest, he was married, children, all that. And he began to notice that his parishioners are getting lazy, <coughs> dissatisfied, bored, and so on. He gave talks. He gave inspirational things. He made special concerts and so on to inspire the people. <coughs> but people didn't change. He talked to local uh, other friends, priests. But they didn't particularly have the problem. And he felt that his parishioners are actually sinking into a state of oblivion of spiritual life. And he, being a good priest, felt very sorry about that. So one day, he ran out of the city, out of the, his house, and he began to scream. He put on chains on him. He tore his hair. And there's a the poor Father Peter. And they felt terribly sorry. He behaved like a man. In order to evoke in people's compassion. 
to touch their hearts. And he behaved crazy. He took upon himself the foolishness for Christ's sake. He would scream and yell, finally they put him in the, on chains. They chained him to a, to a the prison, in a, to a manhouse. He said, <coughs> inwardly, he did Jesus' prayer. And the result was that his parishioners began to change. Of course, it's an ex extreme case, because he became a saint. He was a holy man. God represents Peter of Uglich, the city of Uglich, where he was um, sacrificing, he sacrificed himself. He always was sacrificing himself, as a priest should, but here he thought that other methods don't work. And he sort of crucified himself <coughs> openly. And many people were touched by the fact that he took such a terrible thing upon himself, <coughs> behaved like absolute lunatic. And those who, who had hearts, they would look at him and lament and change their lives. Later on, when he sort of came back again to his behavior, normal behavior, he became an elder because by that time he became clairvoyant. He was a clairvoyant elder. Or another case of uh, Father George of Chiprikov. This Father Peter died in 1855. He was the spiritual father of Abbas Antonina of Kashan. And his picture is in northern Thebaid, and um, he was a um, uh, spiritual father of the Kashan uh, community. There was another one, George, who died in 1918. <coughs> he was killed, murdered by communists. Or not by communists, by one man. His story you probably heard before. It's the father, George, who <coughs> went through seminary, and after seminary, was given by a bishop, a small parish, very poor. He already had children, little babies, and his wife. They were very poor. And they came to this parish, and it turned out to be that nobody goes to church. In other words, there's a, they just built a big saloon, and everybody's there. The whole life of that particular village was in that saloon. And everybody drank and danced and all that. And when he would ring the bell at church, no one would come. And so he uh, was poor. Nobody would pay any money. So his wife made him big, big scene and said, you should go back to the bishop and say that we can't live in a parish like that because we have children, we have to have children. It's impossible. And he didn't want to bother the bishop knowing that he won't get too much ahead. But um, he thought that his good wife, that his wife insisted, and so one day, he decided to go to a monastery as a pilgrim. So he took a bath, and went to you know, the bathhouse, washed himself clean, his wife gave him clean um, clothing. And instead of taking a horse, which she thought he would go using a horse <coughs> to go to the, bishop, to the bishop, he did not take the horse, but walked, took off his cassock and walked like a simple peasant to Optina, hoping that see, he would see Elder Ambrose and he will uh, tell him what to do. <coughs> and he came there, entered the monastery, there's hundreds <coughs> of people, everybody wants to see this elder. And the elder <coughs> is sick and frail and, and, and <coughs> not even in the monastery, but <coughs> away in the skeet. So he came to this skeet, the plate that as you enter the ski, that's right there is a picture of the ski right there. You came right in here, see? That's where the elder will see women. But this is the gate and the belfry. And you men enter here and from inside he will receive the men. And the women will enter here. That's the Hibaka it's called. That there's the entrance. And so here was hundreds of people around from. And they all want to see the elder. And he dressed like a peasant simple with a, with a knapsack in the back with his bread and, and he thought hmm, well I guess I won't be able to see him all of a sudden somebody says well the elder is coming out so the door opened up and this frail figure of this elder barely barely standing on his, on his uh, feet came out and the crowd Lord itself to get a blessing. He blessed them. They knelt. He blessed them. And all of a sudden, through the whole crowd, he says, Priest George, 
go home and build a church the mother of God. And remember, there's two of you on one of them. <laughs> and walked away. And, uh, and he said, who is going to be that? Yeah, Prince George. And the women neighbor said, you must be Prince George. That must be you. He talks to you as he talks about you. He went, he came home <coughs> and saw that the situation is pretty bad. Wife is very bad. They are very angry. And he figured out one, there's two of you and one of him, two of you, God and you, and one devil. So the devil is outnumbered. See? So, and built the church. So he came, there's nobody. They're dancing in the saloon. And the wife is weeping. The floorboards are all worn out of church. And he's all this in despair, and he's supposed to even build a church, stone church. So he came to the belfry, crossed himself, rang the bell to church, came in, church, did all the lampadas, took an acophist, the mother of God, planted his feet right in the middle of the church, and began to sing the acophist. Once, twice, three, ten, twenty, forty, fifty times in a row. And the people, Yes, and every time the new coffee, he rings the bell again. <laughs> and the people in the saloon hear the bell ring. You know, what in the world is going on? The, the, the priest must be crazy. Nobody's there. He rings the bell. <laughs> Let's take a look. They came, opened the door, looked through the crack, and see this poor priest all sweating. Keeps on singing. He's already hoarse. And, uh, keeps on singing. And one lady... Looked and figured there's something wrong. Something must be going on. So she came close to him. And he says, Sweet is Jesus, you know. And she sang with him. And she felt the heat and energy coming out of him. Warm, he's spraying, he's squeezing out all the best he has. So she ran to her neighbor and said, The priest went crazy. He's praying. Quickly, your aunt is sick. This one is sick. Quickly, we'll give Nathan look while he's praying. We might have. So he runs to prayer and gives him. I said, Yes, Mary, Sir Alexander, Sylvia, Again. And they figured out that he, some would say, he flipped his lid. But actually, he was begging God because there are two of them, and devil is one. He had to get all those people from the saloon into his church. And those women started calling others. And then men started coming in. The whole night through, the church was built. The next day, they started liturgy. And within a year, he built a stone church. It's interesting that they say he was so involved. He was praying all the time, nonstop. He was with God. He became like a vehicle. And people, crazy people would come to him. These possessed people. And I knew a woman right here, this woman, right here. <coughs> she, when she was a young girl, became a nun. She visited him. And she entered the church <coughs> while he was doing exorcisms. And as he prayed, there was a woman uh, dragged in with those convulsions and, and the, the foaming in the mouth. And as the priest, Father George, placed a cr uh, took a cross uh, over her head, there was like an explosion, and she, with her own eyes, saw a ball, like a transparent ball, run out of the church, and there was an explosion. And the woman woke up as if there's nothing there. She, with her own eyes, saw this demonic apparition. So this priest became filled with um, power, spiritual power. They even say that he refused to build the church, because that would mean he had to take that church apart. So they started building a church around that church. <laughs> and they built the, man, the whole thing. When it's whole finished, then they took this apart. And he continued standing there praying. See? Now that's a pastor for you. And of course, there's no more. The saloon was out of business. <laughs> then there was another one. His name was uh, Father Constantine Matfeev. He was a village priest who knew obtinate elders. <coughs> And he was giving flaming sermons. 
But his system was this. As he gave sermons, he would, of course, address his parishioners. And he would, as he would address, his intent was to help people with various problems. You are lazy, you are uh, constantly uh, judging, and you are uh, exalting yourself as great nobility, as a big thing, and all, you know, all kinds of problems. So when he gave sermon, he prayed to God that his, whatever comes out of his mouth would heal or give sal salvation to these problems, to uh, annul the problem that they, or at least people would face them. So as he gave the sermon, he would look, and he would pour out how he managed, I don't know, but somehow he combined the subject of the gospel with the sermon that would touch, address everyone. And we know interesting information that the famous Russian writer, Nikolai Gogol, was, was high society, he was sort of bored with church and all that, and he was traveling one day, it was Sunday morning, and as he was traveling, he saw this church in the hill, and he said to the coachman, he said, stop, I want to see the church. It's Sunday morning, they're ringing the bells, so maybe I'll come to church. So he came to the church, he put a candle, so, and then, like high society of his hat, and so on, stood there, <coughs> and um, the, sir, the priest came out, the priest was nothing special, sort of, and then they did the love, then he came out and started giving a sermon. And during the sermon, this author, this writer, famous writer, feels that what that priest is saying, he is revealing about himself. That to him, his life is open. That what he's saying is directly addressed to him. He <coughs> identifies enough hints to say that he knows him. So he's absolutely shaken. And after the service was over, when people come to cross with the, for the antidorium, and this author was shaken to the, to the max. And the priest says, don't worry, my dear. Your soul needs an experienced guide. Why don't you come nearby? It's up in the monastery. There's a nice elder by the name of Makaris. He will settle all your questions. And that man had all these questions. And he became spiritual son of Elder Makari Wopti. In contemporary literature, on Gogol, stemming from communist sources, nothing is mentioned about this man, as if he did not exist. They only skip, the, they call him some kind of fanatic. They don't even know. The whole idea of Makari Optin and how he influenced this famous writer, when the writer destroyed his, his, one of his novels that he wrote, is absolutely as if it doesn't exist, because people refuse to see contempt, especially contemporary literary people, they're very unchurchly or they're so psychologically inclined that they miss the spiritual aspect which Russian tradition has. It seems like sort of talking about, well anyway, we have to go on, it's almost finished. Next thing, this priest therefore was clairvoyant and was able to help and we believe he, as Dostoevsky said, all, uh, we all came out from Gogol's overcoat. Mm -hmm. And Gogol <coughs> had a famous short story, Overcoat, probably some of you read. And that is the story of a man who was a poor clerk somewhere, and he is uh, ridiculed and uh, constantly um, uh, all of our, uh, people where he works, they evoke in him his inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. And therefore he is suffering from this uh, very bad self-opinion. And he sees that most of the people who have this lovely latest fashions overcoats, everybody respects them. So he figured if only he would save enough money and have an overcoat made, then everybody would respect him. And sure enough, they, um, he started saving money. He came to the tail and he tried, tried to finally fit at him, and he finally put this overcoat. And as he came to work, everybody's eyes were on him. And they were surprised. What a talented, what a great young man they had amidst them. And they really never valued him. 
and began to respect him. And of course, they invited him to a party. It was a wonderful party. He was the heart of the party. All the young ladies were simply smiling and charmed by his presence. He was so outstanding in that overcoat. And in the evening, when the, the party, in fact, he couldn't even stay there any longer. His heart beat. He was so inspired. He was so moved that finally the real me is coming out. <laughs> the real people that are respecting. And so he couldn't even stay to the end of the party. It was so, and there's some nice young ladies. Here. He almost proposed and so on. <laughs> and it was so inspiring that he couldn't, his heart beat, he couldn't stay in the party long. He went home. And as he walked and crossed a, a certain um, a street, a street, robbers came and robbed him of his overcoat. <laughs> he came home and died. And uh, Dostoevsky says, all Russian, we all Russian uh, writers come out from that overcoat. In other words, the, we view, we view reality uh, with that the poor, the poor unfortunate man. We view, that's what humi Dostoevsky's humiliated and uh, injured book and the idiot and uh, crime and punishment comes from that. Then the famous Liskov, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. comes from that. Tolstoy was one borrowed from that. The chair of constantly concentrated on the poor boy came so. The whole idea was this, that <coughs> the, poor, the poor man um, oh, um, in the eyes of God is treasurable son and great darling. But in the eyes of the fallen world, and that's why his name even that man is a kaki kaki, which means um, guileless. And his daddy was also Mr. Guileless. So, now, this is the image of the priest. The priest of a parish who is in charge. The priest in the village in Russia for a thousand years were they did not depend on a salary. The priests had to have their own household. They had a guard, a piece of blood, they had horses and cows. They had to take care. There was no salary. The priest, when he would have weddings or baptisms or whatever, they would pay, pay him you know, for, the, for the duties, for his labor. But there would be no uh, um, salary. The, even though the state, the whole state and church were one, with the city priests, they did receive the salary because they had, a, they were sort of a different, their main job was teachers, which are coming to next week. But the simple priest was free of dependency upon people, dependency on the state, on the external. He depended on God, whatever the earth um, gave him, and also whatever could kind people could donate or whatever. He was not a, uh, a cleric. No, 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 he was not a hireling. Huh? Not a hireling. Not, yeah, not a hireling. I meant not a, like, a, uh, like a clerk. clerk who receives his pay for a certain uh, like time payment. It has nothing to do with that because he's supposed to be the knower of souls. The second type of um, priesthood, or what is the duty is that of a teacher. A priest as a teacher is, it's expected to be, each priest to teach. Usually these teachers were educated men. They would be in the cities and they would be uh, bound up with schools. In each society, the, uh, um, even right now in Finland and in Germany they have that, they teach religion. The term is not religion, but it's called the law of God. That is just they translated into English the book, a text of the Russian book called Law of God. Jordan just came out. Um, it deals with the creed, the prayers, morning prayers, and all what, what the prayer book contains, um, the essentials of our faith expounded, and the teacher and the priest is usually teaches that. Usually lay people, lay, te uh, pre uh, lay people never taught that. Always priest does. And he comes, and when he comes in, he always, of course, in the grass and the cross and all that. And as a rule, usually the priest is very kind and loving 
and takes care of the worst students. <coughs> and even the worst students get the best marks in his class. He's very compassionate. And his main tone is to see that the behavior of the student, the attitude, or the enthusiasm towards, towards the law of God or to the subject is on a very high level. And it usually worked because everybody knew that they would get a good mark. And therefore, they would be always, and that would hurt the priest. The position would be always with reverence. He comes in, and the kids usually quiet down because the priest usually starts giving interesting stories, the Bible, and so on. And children, as a rule, loved everywhere that very uh, lesson. And it ended up he would even give candy and so on, that type of thing. Uh, it was a sort of relief from academic uh, studies. And at the same time, uh, people like St. John of Kronstadt held that position of the teacher from almost to the very end. The teacher, the priest as a teacher, is very important because teaching as such or acquiring knowledge is bound up with the reality which is the result of God. So the acceptance of Christian philosophy was introduced to a young soul through a father figure, a, diva, a priest of divinity. In other words, he set the philosophic tone, the hierarchy of values, and the um, 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 acceptance of the set of values, and also acceptance of one's position in the society. In other words, the bad boys who sit in the back and throw papers on and so on, misbehave and so on, these were actually turned into friends of the priest. He was able to touch their hearts because he knew the reason why they behave like that very often is either their own private thing or they are afraid of something or they're treated bad. Mostly it is simply belittled. Very often other uh, uh, say jealousy, envy, and so on. So the priest approached absolutely different. So therefore, in each school, high school, the position of a priest was that of a um, counselor or the one who sets the tone. And since the society was Christian, therefore the priest would give the Christian philosophy of life, the value of what is right, what is wrong, the Christian ethics, would be would come through the priest. Therefore, the and the priests are not necessarily have to be highly educated and sort of a big, big uh, uh, scholarly minds was not expected, but was expected to have this warm human father figure through whom knowledge about life is uh, received. That's the second. The teachers, these teachers, were bound up not only as, a, as a, um, instructors of external knowledge or public information. They were also, by the virtue of being a priest, they were also expected <coughs> to be the confessors. So he had a very good position. Because when a boy misbehaves in the back of, this, uh, of the class, he, being a spiritual father and a confessor, has an access to the boy's soul. So between classes, he would talk to him. And in a confessive level. Because his intent was not to grade the kid. His intent is to see to it that his soul fits OK with life. That's his main aim. <coughs> so everybody looked at this that he has a very advantageous position. That he's not only teaching. But at the same time, he has access to the inner part of each man, the holy part, which is the conscience and the soul. And thus he became the, since the priest is supposed to be Sertzevietis, the knower of soul and heart, <coughs> therefore there was this respect. Now, there are cases where, uh, <coughs> well, of course, you know, you have the, I didn't, I didn't give you much information about the sources, about 
Saint Basil the Great talks about it. We'll talk about that later on, about the sources where you're supposed to read about the, uh, what a priest is, you know, St. John Chrysostom and so on. Our concern right now is to present a picture of what is a, of a priest uh, in the aspect and then also the parish. You know, the parish, is said, is supposed to be the, the uh, catacomb family, the catacomb church, <coughs> the church of the um, in embryo surrounded by hostility and has oneness of soul. That is supposed to be, and the priest is the, um, the uh, leader there. Now, uh, the teacher, as I said, is uh, the one who teaches the law of God, sets the tone for life. He is also the opener of the spiritual, mystical world of each individual. We have a term called that the mother, the function of a mother to a man, a human being, is that she not only gives the life and feeds with through herself until the child is weaned, but at the same time she breathes into the child the love for other worlds. That's why this, her voice is soft and so on. That's the lullabies come in. The idea, all these fairy tales, all this world of beauty, refinement. And unfortunately, this realm was taken over recently by a certain individual called Mickey Mouse and others. And all cribs and all little children <coughs> are filled with Porky Pigs and Mickey Mouses <laughs> and Goofies. And uh, the imaging or the icons of Goofies obviously leaves a very definite impression. It gives um, uh, an icon, an image, of somebody who is elevated as a hero, but at the same time, therefore, has a license to goof, mm. to be a stupid, weak individual who really does not care about the law of God. If you take the fairy tales and all these legends and all that, they all have a certain particular value. Their approach is to present some kind of ideal, some kind of a, a redemptive quality Cinderella gets her prince and something like that. You labor and you get something. But when you have the goof, your porky pig, or and the now those jumping burgers from McDonald's, there is really no value. A child is presented with this, uh, with these hero something, and they compete with the world of the mother. Now, what is the world of the mother? About the subject of femininity, we'll talk later on in more detail. Meanwhile, I have to say this. A child is conceived through love and passion. As a rule, the feminine gender, being weaker physically, is actually, therefore, attuned more to the spiritual aspect. Women, as a rule, are more spiritual. The femininity aspect, the soul, is the feminine gender. Therefore, the mother is in a position to install into the child, together with the milk and the baby and other business, a very important element which the father can't in the very beginning. And that is a certain longing for either femininity, you call it, or you can call it ideal, which does not have in the beginning these heroes with swords and dragons and so on. It doesn't have them. It has angels. It has icons of Mother of God and so on. The child, therefore, when he goes to church, of course, he sees the male figure in the icon. He identifies himself with the male. He was supposed to stand on that side and the female on that side. So the <coughs> gender is quite identified. And the child before seven years old, when the gender is not yet evoked, puberty didn't arrive, the child is in the realm of this mother's femininity, which is bound up 
with beauty, with the refined voice, and so on. So the child acquires uh, this world of the church through the element that is outside of the mother's terrain. And father didn't come up yet, because that's seven years old, with the idea that there is a spiritual father in the church, and as it is saying, he who would not love, he who will not love his father will never love God the Father. Now, the realm of this uh, this world, this uh, the function of aesthetics of beauty or beauty in a child begins with very early age and it is to is linked to the beauty not earthly beauty with church it's interesting that in church that we decorate with flowers here and there but you will notice that there is really no place for flowers. We are here, here because we have lots of roses and so on. But as a rule, earthly, earthly flowers or earthly decorations are absent in church. They have all these Byzantine designs and so on. But it doesn't have earthly. <coughs> Even the icons are not realistic. The perspective is absent. It's a deliberate deliberate attempt to hint that there is another world. So we will not associate the other world to come with this flowers of this earth. I just recently read, heard an acophist that was made in Russia recently, in which there is a description of singing birds and, and uh, flowers and brooks and fishes and so on. And it's foreign element to all liturgical text. Oh, there is a hint. But it's only because our aim is this other world, from whence Jesus came. And that's what the mother puts in. That's why the mother's job is to, uh, together with the priest, to make the young soul at home in the other world. Then at seven years old, when the first confession comes in, in steps the father, whose job is, with a sword, with all kinds of things, introduce the child to the horrors of the world, the fallen world of murders. He must know the world, and he, the child must know the world, the bad world, and he must know that he will live in it, <coughs> and he has to love certain aspects of it. He cannot be a sissy, he has to be prepared. There's a whole series of interesting novels. One of them is a very, very interesting Russian novel, which should be understood. It's boring reading for us today. It's called Oblomov. It's a story of this young man who is exceedingly lazy. And the whole thing is he just lays, just sleeps through the whole thing. He's a rich landowner, the you know, <coughs> servants and so on. And there's a lovely girl, and he's even too lazy to love her. And finally, he sort of philosophizes, and finally he loses her. And it becomes sort of a bomb and nothing, and dies. But the point is that, interesting, that the reason, the, pro the tragedy of this Amlova was not the fact that he was lazy, it's the fact that his inward world, that world, was wonderful, loving, and kind, but it got arrested. The father figure didn't come with a sword and masculinity and roughness and so on, and was not loving, so that the man was afraid of the world, afraid of even loving. That's our problem today. Many of our gays and so on bound up straight with that thing. So this whole business of <coughs> addressing, addressing the other world is bound up with the priest. Priest comes in and introduces this world. And it's a beautiful world, and it's real world, but it requires valor, poetry, fights, unseen warfare, um, uh, fasting, praying, kneeling, sweating, and so on. 
It's not the sweet, perpetually sweet mummy's, mummy's embraces. Now, the priest is a, has a function in it. And finally, um, this opener of the spiritual world, which priest is supposed to be, unfortunately now is taken over by New Agers. Because the laziness of Orthodox pastors, the, la the un-Christian attitude of Orthodox parishioners, who have forgot that every parish is supposed to be like a monastery. It's supposed to be built in a, in a model of catacomb Christians who were so holy that Holy Spirit descended upon them. <coughs> it is a special holy realm, heavenly realm on earth, this is parish. Unfortunately, today is not the case. And therefore, people lose and become born and become victims of Blavatsky and so on. Now, the final thing is this. The priest is a public figure. Oh, yes. The, before I go, that the, the world of the priest is actually that of philokalic wisdom. Because philokalic wisdom is this prayer and concentrated. And uh, is this a sea here? Remember the silence. The silence that I talked, Father Adrian talked about, which is the realm where <coughs> the young soul is to find solace. Our young people today are raised without any solace. They have no comfort. Their souls are <coughs> constantly agitated. They are from one, and even rock and, rock and roll music expresses very well. Rock and roll music has that metallic beat to it, which is actually comes from factories. And the factories, those who work in factories, they, they can, um, especially if you work in a factory, and read Philokale, it comes very clear. Because you have this perpetual beat, metallic beat, and you want to get out of it. And so you add things to it, but the beat continues, and that keeps you going. This is um, this, the beat, the rock beat, which we have today, is not an accidental thing. It's clear indication that this um, industrial revolution uh, rhythm already entered the soul, the sphere of a soul of a Christian. And a soul cannot get out. It leaves, but the beat is still going on. What I'm trying to say is that the atmosphere of the church, the parish, the priest's home, and one's own bedroom is to remind one of the other world where Jesus and angels and saints dwell. Therefore, if you introduce children to lives of saints, not the fairy tale ones. Fairy tale is okay when the child has to be introduced to beauty. The Rapunzel thing and the, and the, the princess and the, the seven geese carry her on the sleeping beauty with a kiss and so on. It's all very <coughs> lovely and pretty. But that is, and that hints at reality too. But the lives of saints are rough. They're cut them into pieces and so on, and yet they live that other world. In other words, the reality is clothed in beauty, but to the world it is rough, but actually, like after a good opera, or a dramatic opera, when people die and everybody's killed, huh, you feel relieved because there's catastrophes occurs. You're like after Lucia de Lamamor, when they finally they both die, you feel relieved that I'm sure they'll be in heaven together. Why? Because it's a Christian path, Christian approach. Now, suffering has redemptive quality. Now, the last part is the priest as a public figure. That is where we, in 20th century, Orthodox pastors fail to the max. The society has removed the authority of a priest from the daily 
uh, strata of life. Society does not seek the opinion of a man of the cloth. Society does not, it actually, would, they would like to, but it's not in the habit any longer. In a Christian society, very, well, we have a little bit in the uh, you know, inauguration, in a presidential inauguration, we have a, uh, a reverend comes to them. And so we have here and there a little bit. But tra traditionally, a priest or bishop, that's his position, is the one that sets the tone for society as well. He gives a sermonette at the, at the <coughs> graduation or various important assemblies. And when there's some kind of trouble, he comes out there and he gives, supposed to speak on television, on radio, supposed to say, <coughs> of course they all debate and attack, attack him and so on. But his duty, whether he wins or not, whether he's followed or not, his duty is to give the Christian ideal, the principle of Christianity as our Judeo-Western, Judeo-Christian, Western civilization, is based on it. We say in our nickels and dimes, we say, in God we trust. Well, this very God, <coughs> whom we in our pockets trust, must be also expressed in our society. It's true that our society is very liberal and very anti-Christian in many ways, but the pastor still has to be heard. If the pastor cannot come up on television, doesn't have enough money to present and all that, he has a right to make public lectures. He is obliged by being a pastor because his flock work. They people, those people who work in the society, they do that. They check. For example, when I was working uh, in a factory and I did not have television, I noticed that whenever they would show some kind of a film and everybody, in all these channels, everybody would see it, in the morning, they all talk <coughs> about subject. Mm -hmm. They, not only on the subject, but related subjects to that. You can see, obviously, they've been fed this particular idea, and it comes out in the expressions, ways, and if there's some kind of jokes, they keep the joke. If a girl wears some kind of a hat, they wear the hat, the hair, doing all that. It's all, we are influenced by a particular thing. Well, an Orthodox pastor supposed to do that job, supposed to do that influencing the society with other worldliness, with the images of St. Barbara, St. Seraphim, of Sarov, Tikhon, of Zadonsk, and all of so on. He's supposed to present that because these are ideals, these are positive phenomena which is necessary for the spiritual growth of his flock. And he must be brave enough, of course, he might be put to shame and people laugh at him and so on. That's okay. In Monterey there was a priest, a wonderful priest. A man who was raised even in monasteries. He was a little boy, he was an orphan, and monks in Pachaya Lavra raised him. He was a wonderful priest, good man, and I say he was a good orator. He spoke well. His, his <coughs> phraseology, his uh, thought was clear, his images was right. He was a good preacher. But he was in a society, this, he was a priest in this group in Monterey where most of the where people were the teachers in the language school, experts in Russian language. <clears throat> so whenever that priest would open his mouth, he would see his congregation judging him. Because he used too many adjectives or too many ah, ands and he made an ah and there's not a, you know, they judged him to such an extent that it made, it paralyzed him. He would come up and say a word, <coughs> couldn't say anything. You know, his, his parishioners gobbled him up. And the result was, he was impotent as a pastor. He was a wonderful man. He was tall, handsome, got a nice voice, beautiful tenor voice. He knew all the service, knew all these ancient tones. His wife was a wonderful lady. They both sang beautifully all these tones. It was a sheer pleasure to come to his church, which was empty. Mm. Mm. And he would come anyway. Every Saturday night he would come there alone. If I come, I'd be at the clerics. He said the whole service, well, during the 
weekday he would serve liturgy all by himself. And somebody said, Bashka, you're supposed to have a priest, someone, uh, somebody to put together with a priest, somebody's supposed to sing and answer, Lord have mercy, when you say a petition. He says, well, I don't have any, so I guess the angels have to do it. <laughs> and he was seen. He was seen um, in a very good state as a holy man. There was a fight over, when they started building the church, there was a fight to which feast day or which saint should the parish be dedicated? Huge fights. Two, there are two groups. One group was for St. Nicholas, another one for protection, another guy. And they fought. They called each other on the telephone. It's the nastiest thing. Big fight. Finally, he was bored with the whole thing. He said, I don't know. I don't know. And his master said, no, you are a priest. You're supposed to somehow, you know, right? So they voted. The vote was 50-50. <laughs> Didn't work. He gave up on this and said, well, let God take care of it. That night he saw a dream. He saw a dream that the church was being built and it's much more, pro much more progressed than it was before. So he was very happy. Even the doors were there. And the doors were locked. And he, think, and he hears service going on. And he thought, who dared to get in there? And the door is actually, looks, and the door was not locked. The door is closed. And he opened the door, and in the altar, the only door of the altar, there is somebody serving in a long black mantle. As he entered the church, that priest who serves would turn around and bless him, and it was Saint Seraphim of Seraph. Clearly. Clearly, just like in the picture. He came home and said to Machka, I mean, when he, when he woke up to him, Machka said, you know what it says? I, I saw a dream that said, sir, what does it mean? <coughs> she said, well, maybe get, get this. I have to go do what it works. Fix the coffee. So <laughs> he, was, he was fixing coffee. And as the coffee was made, he sat in his armchair. And he sat in the armchair <coughs> like this. And he, and he accidentally put a hand there in between. And there's a piece of paper. He pulled up. And there was a leaf leaflet from the calendar, the daily calendar, you know, it was January the 2nd, mm -hmm. St. Servant. And he says to her, what do you, what do you think about that? What about that? She says, stupid. It's clearly St. Servant wants to have, to have that church. And so that evening he gathered them and they said, <laughs> and who's, and I'm not going to, and he says, well, brothers and sisters, and told him about the dream, about the little thing. <coughs> they were silent. Total silence. And they said, Father, we agree. <laughs> It'll be said, sir. He said, that's fine with us, but what about the bishop? <laughs> <laughs> well, so he comes to San Francisco to the bishop, Bishop Tsegan was there. And he comes, and he says, never I, I come to the delegation of the church. We have, uh, finally, uh, and we, uh, <laughs> on, you know, it's <coughs> very important. And, uh, maybe we have your uh, Come, come, what, uh, what is it, what is it? <laughs> well, well, uh, well, we um, uh, we finally decided, you know, we're building the church, we finally decided to dedicate it to Saint Sarah. What? <coughs> we began to tremble. You mean Saint Sarah? Why, how dare you? I will not tolerate this. And walked away. Then you heard some kind of a shifting thing. He stood there trembling. <laughs> One thing you're doing your own flock, but when the bishop is a man, you know. <laughs> he stood there trembling. Finally, the bishop comes up with a large icon of Saint Sir and said, I bring you this icon as a blessing <clears throat> to your parish. Go on, dedicate to it. I failed. I wanted to have my side altar dedicated to Saint Sir. But you usurped it. <laughs> Take the icon. Go to <laughs> So he was one of those one of those priests who was a wonderful priest. And yet he died, no one cared, absolutely nothing. His flock lost the concept of the catacomb oneness of soul and thus lost, missed a good priest. 
And in conclusion, we have to say this. <coughs> St. John of Kronstadt yeah. was a wonderful priest. He was serving God as a priest, throwing down holiness, and as a minister, he was a great minister. He administered the poor people, and also as a public figure, he traveled all over. He was so public that he was so available that even the Tsar, when he was dying, insisted that he would come and hold his hands over the Tsar's head because he was poisoned, actually, Alexander III. And under the hands of us, St. John of Russia, the Tsar died. So it's very public. His opinion was valued and so on. He was very instrumental in founding many monasteries, convents. Many people <coughs> went to uh, started magazines. The whole magazine, Kolako, it was his. The Ruski Palomnik was bound up with him. There were many uh, disciples of his, many people, his spiritual children became uh, bishops and so on. His <coughs> image was very functional. There were many of them like that. Not as great as he, of course, but uh, John was John Vastorgov. He was orator. He, was, he spoke much. In the recent time, we had, we had um, Father Adrian was like that during the years in the 50s. He was very outspoken. He was a big man, um, uh, highly revered. And uh, his sermons were repeated. People did, he was instrumental in uh, starting communities, churches, um, and so on. The magazines, <coughs> magazine called the <coughs> Catholic Holy Russia. Then there was um, Archbishop John also like that. And in, even recently in Russia, Saint Father, the Father Dmitry Dutkov, it's a very interesting phenomenon, wonderful, fearless priest. And recently a man who was killed, his name was Alexander Men in Russia, very popular. He appeared in the television song. Now, of course, I'm talking about the Orthodox group. Of course, there are, you know, Billy Graham and others. But the aim of each of these people, of this public, is to present Orthodox worldview so that his, so that part of his parish flock would, living in the world, would benefit. So that their ideal would be raised. So they will be above the contemporary violence and uh, immorality. He would, they would pull them out of this. They would inspire them. <coughs> them. It's interesting that nowadays it's clear that all these heroes that we hear, all these movie stars and, uh, and all that, they are all very degraded. Their world in which they live is immoral is actually very boring. The only thing they have is money and this fame. But it, all that is pro propelled or is promoted by people who do not care about Christian values. In fact, that very series of lectures that we have that, um, from our professor is clear indication how people were undoing Christianity. We live in a time when Christianity is almost gone the very essence of Christian values is almost gone. If you watch TV, or if you look at it, you, I, made an I made a little investigation years ago, that every three minutes on any of the channels, they are, they are channeling sin. They are giving models of sin. Either murder, theft, or rape, or anything. All kinds of things. They are actually channeling models. They are modeling negative thing. No one models positive things. We can rarely, nowadays people don't even know the Frank Capra movies when he was interested in promoting these old movies in the third so minute they have, have good, you know, these messages across. But there, it's unheard of it now. They have these attempts, but as you clearly see that Highway to Heaven or the Prairie House on the Prairie and so on, but you can see that this actually sinks, these images, they sink in the flood of unrighteousness today, which is clear indication that Orthodox public figures, priests, are not doing their job. <clears throat>
Now, the Orthodox bishops, I'm not here to say negative things about bishops, but I had an incident when I went and opened up a little mission in Moscow, Idaho. And it took me quite some energy to put there. And we got a little storefront, and we got the, the, the priest and the people that had icons, and even chandelier, and we had services. When I came back to the bishops, to my bishop, and said, said to him that now you are also bishop over a new parish dedicated to Moscow Hadars in Moscow, Idaho, he said to me, who needs it? And I said, well, those people who are there, <laughs> they're only a pain for me. And I said then, well, in that case, you should assign those people who it will not be a burden upon you. He said, any organization, I mean, any ecclesiastical thing like that is a pain. A brother that had nothing. I can, in other words, I can barely manage my own stuff. Well, with that attitude and a, as an apostle, it is <laughs> obvious that the position of our priest today is almost, <coughs> almost impossible. But we have examples of apostles. They didn't worry about that. They didn't worry about chandeliers or anything like that. All they did is they went from one place to another and drew down holiness into that midst that parish or that group, that family, that wanted God more than anything else, and they're willing to die for him. The problem is that today society has turned our life as disposable. And it's just like the, the cups in McDonald's and Burger King, just throw away. And many people just kill. And the kids, young teenagers, kill themselves and leave messages out of them you can see clearly that they were not given any ideal. No, no big thing to live for. And the result is that it's the same, the state is the same. But we must, as I say again, we must not sort of capitulate to that. We must realize that we are pastors, we are given the job by God, we are called by God to do the work of God. I feel nowadays that a bookstore, an Orthodox bookstore, has more power than a parish. Simply because a parish today is threatening to those people who are who've been confused, who standing on the sort of on an edge, they know what to do. And a bookstore that has on the shelves both icons, images, and these texts that are holy, that you can come in, look, take, or not. You are free to wander in and leave. And this way, it has more practical, practical value. More of them wouldn't even know some of the bookstores are on wheels, and they travel. Some have dogs, others don't. We even have Orthodox laundromats. You come to a laundromat, you, you wash your underwear, and at the same time, you see there's icons and books, and you pick them, and while it washes you, all of a sudden, read, discover a thing like the ladder. No more, I know. But it's, that's okay. If the model was good enough. And um, so these, and, and in these books, there's something, anybody can take them. Anybody is expected to be a uh, uh, Christian apostle. We know that the women, uh, were <coughs> very effective in ancient Christian uh, period. In fact, it wouldn't be for women, there wouldn't be any Christianity. Um, because there was this fervency put to practical application. They, uh, uh, they approached it not as only some kind of esoteric group, elect group, but they brought that down to their families, their husbands, and so on. It's interesting that there are cases when this righteous, righteous, um, um, in the life of um, Ahmed the calligrapher, there is this in interesting incident that he was married to a slave girl who was secretly was Christian. And every time she would come and receive Holy Communion secretly from him, and, he would, she, would, and she would come from church, he would smell 
undescribable, wonderful aroma. And he would love her more than ever. And he finally, he was so attracted to her because secretly she was a true Christian himself. And finally to understand that he discovered Christ through her and became a saint. <clears throat> that is, ex we are expected not to give in. We're supposed to realize the function of our missionary work, our pastoral and like in bookstores, our pastoral work. We know we have here some people who came straight from, from um, our bookstore that just wandered idly into the bookstore looking for cross in order to make them into a earrings or something, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, my friend, is that true or not? Close. And, um, and the result was that these individuals <coughs> became novices. They wanted to dedicate their life because it made sense. So, in conclusion, Orthodox pastor has in his possession tools of eternal life these tools, with these tools, he can either destroy a soul or lead it to heaven while being on this earth, while, as the Archbishop John says, with his both feet firmly planted upon this earth. <coughs> what I said he might destroy it is if he begins to, which is another subject we'll talk about, begins to overshadow God's presence with his own personality. When he begins to play elder, imitate someone, assuming that he has the power and he wants to sort of play that part. That's called phony elders. Where people are overshadowing God's grace with themselves. But that's a subject in itself. When we'll talk about eldership. I think partially posh, we have talked about it, but not perhaps not enough. <coughs> well, on, about confession and eldership. Uh, but to end up is that we, Orthodox Christians, are given these tools, these tools in a, in a hum in the hands of a humble pastor who does not assume much about himself, become vehicles through which man ordinary man in today's society can partake <coughs> of paradise. He can adjust that man to that, like we have found the reckless, tune him like an instrument so that divine hands can play like on a harp on the soul of that contemporary person who is actually otherwise lost in this, our society. All right, that's about it. Thank you very much. <coughs> we didn't have the company.